And here is the corral leading up to the altar, and we'll let Jim Caldwell tell the story. From above, the outline of a double wall corral is visible at Sinai's base. Next to it is a slaughter platform and the altar. The stream bed can be seen running behind and around the corral, as well as the white pillars out in front. From well inside the forbidden fence, I soon discovered the Saudis had completed a partial excavation of this site in 1996. You can plainly see the outlines of the slaughter platform and the corral directly behind it. Next to that is a pit, complete with layer upon layer of ash and the access area to the sacrificial altar. In Exodus 24, 5, young men sacrificed many oxen as peace offerings to the Lord there at Sinai. This large corral would have been necessary to lead them up to the slaughter platform. There they would have been sacrificed and the blood captured in basins and Moses would have placed the offerings into the fire directly behind him. The altar itself was just beyond the fire and there he sprinkled the blood. Just in front of the corral and the altars are the remains of white pillars and their foundation stones. We have found them to be made of a crude alabaster and discovered the source of this stone near the crossing site of the Red Sea. Moses built an altar and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel as recorded in Exodus 24, 4. These pillars are each of differing sizes, possibly according to the number of each tribe of Israel that they represented. As you can see, they are very, very well preserved. Looking back upward from the altar area, a large cave is visible from below. First Kings 19, 8 and 9 tell us that Elijah came to Horeb, mountain of God, and then found a cave to lodge in. This is yet another bit of evidence needed to identify Mount Sinai, found here at Jebel Laws. I was only able to get inside this cave once, but it was well worth this spectacular view of the valley below. Quite possibly the greatest witness giving validity to Mount Sinai being in Arabia is the rock at Horeb. This enormous rock is split cleanly down the middle and is completely different from anything else in the region. It stands high atop one of the boulder hills that dot the landscape and on the west side of Horeb, not Sinai. The Bible identifies it exactly this way. I'm standing on the back side of the rock here and it's easy to see just how large it really is. As I began my walk between the two giant slabs of rock, I became acutely aware that something entirely miraculous had taken place here long ago. Making my way right through the middle of the split, scriptures started rolling over and over again in my head. They became alive to me as I made it through and sat down on the front side. I began to notice immediately the deep channels that were cut into the stone both in front and the back of this rock. You can see one of these channels clearly here. Deep gouges and grooves are apparent at the base also, along with a strange erosion pattern from below that is unique to this rock and no others in the valley. With rainfall every 10 years amounting to less than an inch here, these very obvious cuts made by copious water flows were indeed compelling. Again, the channels are obvious. As we followed the course of the water all the way down and into the valley, we realized the immediate area under the rock was of a smooth and unbroken granite, unlike the crushed particles of stone we'd been hiking on all over the rest of the region. If this rock was the one Moses struck, the waters would have cooled up substantially and the whole of Israel, including their flocks, could have taken their fill and been satisfied. Psalm 78, 15 and 16 says, he clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused the waters to run down like rivers. In the same area that the split rock at Rephidim is found, dozens of ruins dot the landscape 
including cairns, kilns, and stone furnaces. These circular formations, however, are by far the most intriguing and seem to be the oldest in the valley. Arranged with several connected together, they even have doorways and thresholds. The Amalek came to fight Israel at Rephidim. I found at least eight sling stones among these circles in evidence of that very battle. The circles are oriented toward this ridge where we saw a brilliant light in April of 1992. Arab lore tells of a mysterious mountain of lights here called Jebel al-Nur. From Rephidim, we travel south to the Straits of Tehran and the crossing site of the Red Sea. Here, we found an outstanding witness to a catastrophic event. Massive coral heads have been ripped from their bases and thrown far upon the shore. In numerous places, bronze pieces are embedded among the coral and the twisted shells. Amazingly, this petrified formation is not found anywhere else along the entire Gulf of Aqaba. And now, to the awesome wilderness of Arabia. South of Mount Sinai, in the most uninhabitable regions of the country, artifacts can be found scattered all over the desert. The arrowheads and spear points found here are known to be of Egyptian design. Their sheer numbers prove that a vast congregation of people passed through this place. Here, you can see the delicate pressure flight points. Beside the arrowheads, more weaponry, such as hand axes and this bola type, have been found in abundance. Others include handheld grinders. The Bible tells us that the women ground